As a kid, I used to play guitar, and I can remember the distinct smell that the strings had and that they would transfer it to my fingers. It was the same smell that I got when I handled coins, and I can remember smelling it on other metallic things like nails, chains on park swings, and railings. So, from a young age, this smell was really locked into my head as being metallic, but the weird thing is that you can't smell metal. And the reason you can't is because metal completely fails the two major requirements for smell. The first major requirement is that it needs to be volatile, meaning that it lets off a vapor. This is because when we smell something, we aren't detecting it directly. What we're picking up is the gas that it's releasing, which can then travel through the air and get to our noses. Almost everything, both liquids and solids, passively release vapor to a certain extent. However, the rate that this occurs at is highly variable and it really depends on the substance's unique properties. In particular, it depends on the strength of the interactions between its molecules. Liquids generally have weaker interactions than solids and they tend to let off more vapor, which is why we usually find them easier to detect. As we move to the solid phase, the interactions get stronger, but some of them do still let off a decent amount of vapor. These more volatile solids are usually organic compounds because their interactions are still relatively weak. However, as we move on to inorganic solids like salts, metals, and minerals, the story changes. The interactions in these are significantly stronger, and all the molecules hold onto each other really tightly. The likelihood of any of these molecules getting enough energy to spontaneously jump to the gas phase and escape is extremely small. And for many inorganic solids, it's low enough that we consider them to be giving off no vapor at all. The one major exception to this though, in terms of metals, is mercury. At room temperature, it's a liquid, which tells us that even though it's a metal, it has relatively weak intermolecular bonds. And because of this, like many other liquids, it's actually able to evaporate and let off vapor. This vapor is one of the biggest dangers when working with liquid mercury, and unfortunately, not only is it invisible, it also has no odor. This is because metals also fail the second major requirement to smell something, which is sensitivity. So not only do pretty much all metals not even release vapor, even if they did, it wouldn't really matter. The question now though is, then what are we smelling? Because as I mentioned before, metals do clearly have a distinct odor. Well, as it turns out, we're actually just smelling ourselves. Our hands are covered in oils and sweat, and when we touch certain metals like iron, copper, or zinc, they catalyze some reactions. In particular, they catalyze the oxidation of various skin oils and they convert them to new ones with different odors. All of these new molecules help create an overall musty odor, but the major one that's responsible for that metal smell is called 1-octan-3-ohn. This is why these metals only smell after they've been touched. If you want to test this out for yourself, you can try washing some coins or something else metallic and then smelling it without ever touching it. If you did a proper job washing it, you shouldn't smell anything except maybe the faint smell of soap. Then, if you pick it up and play around with it a bit in your hand, it should start to stink again. When I first found out about this, I thought it was honestly kind of hard to believe because of how strongly I had associated the scent to metal. So what I wanted to do was to try to make pure one octan 3 own myself and to try putting it on some non-metal things. I thought that maybe if I made some metal smelling glass or plastic, it could be really weird and maybe mess with my brain. When it comes to synthesizing molecules, it's possible to do it all the way from the ground up, but that usually isn't the most efficient way. Generally, you want to start with the cheapest and most available precursor that's closest to the final product. In this case, I think the best thing to start with is 1-octan-3-ol, which is extremely close. To convert it, all I need to do is something called an oxidation reaction, where this alcohol group is converted to a ketone. Now to actually get the 1-octan-3-ol, it's pretty easy because it's often sold as a perfume additive. Oddly enough, it's a natural and major component of mushroom odor, and it has a fungal and kind of earthy smell to it. I ended up picking it up online from a website called The Perfumer's Apprentice, and I got 80 mils of it for $20 US. Now at first, this reaction might seem a bit simple because we're only changing a very small thing, but it's actually a bit tricky. There are many ways to do oxidations in general, but in this case, we have this reactive double bond here. 
a lot of the common methods might attack it and potentially mess it up. To prevent this, I need to be careful with both the conditions and the chemicals that I use and it doesn't leave me with many options. I was able to find a paper though that outlined a method that supposedly worked. So I decided to try it out and these were the main chemicals that I needed to do it. I was able to find most of them online from places like eBay, but this one, called triphenylphosphine dichloride, I couldn't find anywhere. I generally try to avoid it, but in this case, I ended up having to order it from Sigma. But anyway, with all that being said, it's finally time to get started. To a large flask, I added all of the triphenylphosphine dichloride that I had, which was 25 grams. And then on top of this, I poured in 300 ml of DCM solvent, and I turned on the stirring. About a minute later, all the powder had dissolved, and it was now time to set up the cool part of this reaction. The reaction needed to be carried out below around negative 60 C, and the best way to do this is by using a dry ice bath. So to a bowl, I added a bunch of dry ice, and then I poured in some acetone. The acetone immediately started to cool down, and the dry ice let off a lot of CO2 gas. I waited about a minute, and then I lowered in the flask from before, and turned on the stirring. I let it sit there for about 15 minutes, and I occasionally replenished the bowl with more dry ice. I didn't test the temperature, because I didn't, well, have anything to do it with, but at this point, it was definitely at least around negative 70 C. So I started adding the next ingredient, which was DMSO. I didn't just dump it all in though, and I did it slowly and dropwise to make sure that the whole thing stayed cold. As far as I know, the reaction that's going on here hasn't exactly been proven, but the authors of the paper that I was following are pretty sure they know what was going on. As the DMSO was added, it slowly reacted with the triphenylphosphine dichloride to make this intermediate molecule. This intermediate isn't super soluble in cold DCM though, so as the reaction proceeded and more of it was made, it started precipitating out. This caused the solution to turn white and opaque, but the contrast in the flask here isn't the best, so it's kind of hard to tell. This now had to be stirred like this for the next hour, so I covered the top with plastic to prevent any moisture from getting into the flask. And in the meantime, I prepared the alcohol solution that I would need for the next step. So I went and got a beaker, and I added 6.4 grams of the 1 octen 3 all. I then attempted to wash the vial with a small amount of DCM, but there ended up being an error. I honestly have no idea how this happened though, because I've never done anything that clumsy before. I was so shocked by it, that instead of trying to recover things by washing off the vial, I just decided to restart. So I reweighed out the 6.4 grams, and carefully washed the vial this time. Then, it was all diluted with more DCM, up to around 100 ml. I turned on the stirring to mix it all together, and it was pretty much good to go. About an hour later, I came back to the main reaction, and I started adding the alcohol. To try and keep things as cold as possible though, the alcohol solution was pre-chilled using a smaller dry ice bath. When it was eventually all added, I covered the top again and I waited 15 minutes. The reaction here again isn't known for certain, but it's believed that the oxygen in the alcohol attacks the sulfur in the intermediate and it kicks off the other oxygen. This forms this second intermediate molecule, which is kind of a combination between the 1 octen 3 all and the DMSO. At this point, it had been about 15 minutes, and the next thing that I had to do was add some nice and stinky triethylamine. I started out by doing it dropwise, but when there was only about half of it left, I ended up just dumping it in. What's happening here is an acid-base reaction where the basic triethylamine is pulling off an acidic hydrogen. This generates a negative charge, which then attacks the hydrogen in the alcohol. This triggers a whole shift of electrons, where the electrons in the hydrogen bond move to form a double bond with the oxygen, and the sulfur is kicked off. This whole reaction mechanism is very similar to a popular one called the Swern oxidation. In that one though, instead of using the phosphorus compound, it uses something called oxalyl chloride. I almost definitely could have done the Swern here instead, but I chose to do this one because I thought it might have been better. Oxalo chloride is quite hard to get and make, and it's also a lot more dangerous. I figured that if this did end up working, it could be a safer and more accessible alternative. But anyway, assuming that it did work, the final result of this reaction was supposed to be a new carbon-oxygen double bond 
and my beautiful 1 octane 3 own. However, it also made some side products like triphenylphosphine oxide and dimethyl sulfide that I needed to separate out. Before I could process any of it though, I had to let the reaction go to completion by just letting it warm up to room temperature. So I took away the dry ice bath and I let it sit there for about two hours. During this time, a bunch of white stuff settled out and I think this was mostly triphenylphosphine oxide and maybe a bit of triethylamine hydrochloride, but I'm not 100% sure. The next step was to get rid of as much of the DCM and dimethyl sulfide as possible. The authors in the paper probably did it with a fancy thing called a rotovap, but I opted for just a classic distillation. They also did it under vacuum, but I didn't think it was really necessary here. I also didn't really want to use one either, because if I didn't condense things well enough, it would start throwing a lot of stinky methyl sulfide into the air. It all started boiling relatively quickly, because both DCM and dimethyl sulfide have boiling points below 40 C. I then insulated the flask with a bunch of aluminum foil, and I waited for the vapor to make it over. It eventually made it to my cold condenser, where it was recondensed back into being a liquid. This was all slowly collected in my receiving flask, and at first, it was a mixture of the dimethyl sulfide and DCM. However, as I got closer to the end of the distillation, it was probably mostly just DCM. It's kind of hard to see here, but eventually, in the flask, it looked like there was a lot of solid stuff and very little DCM. In the paper, it said to get rid of most of the DCM, and I figured this was good enough. So I took it off the heating, and I cooled it down with some ice water. When I got it back to around room temperature, I added a 50-50 mixture of hexanes and diethyl ether. The purpose of this was to dissolve the 1 octane 3 own, but to kick out all of the triphenylphosphine oxide, which is insoluble in these solvents. The moment it was added, it started to precipitate as a bunch of white powder. To get out as much as possible, it was important to mix it really well, so I just shook it around for a couple minutes. Then to separate it off, I just did a vacuum filtration. I turned on my pump and started pouring everything in, and after just a couple minutes, I was left with this nice white powder. I then washed the flask and all the powder a few more times with more of that 50-50 solution. When I was done, all the triphenylphosphine oxide here was relatively clean, it just had a bunch of solvent mixed with it still. So I just dumped it somewhere to dry for a bit, and then I transferred it to a bottle. Even though it's a byproduct in this reaction, triphenylphosphine oxide can be useful in other ones, so I think it's worth keeping. But in any case, getting back to things, this was everything that filtered through. Now just like before, to get rid of all the solvent, I had to do another distillation. What was nice though was that the glassware was already set up from the last one, so I just had to reattach this flask. I turned on the heating mantle and over the course of a few hours, I slowly distilled over everything. I was eventually left with this oily stuff at the bottom, which I was initially happy with. However, I was also kind of skeptical, because there was just way too much stuff here. Based on the amount of 1 octane 3 all that I used, my maximum yield should only be several milliliters, but this looked like it was something around 40. To cool it down faster, I used ice water again, and I started poking at it. This caused it to start crystallizing, and I was eventually left with a semi-solid paste. Pure 1 octane 3 own is an oil though, so there was clearly a lot of impurity here. But unfortunately, I didn't really know exactly what it was. In the paper, they did it on a really low scale, and because of this, they were able to purify this stuff by column chromatography. However, I scaled things up by about a factor of 50, and it's just way too much to do it with. So now, I had to deviate from the procedure, and come up with my own purification method. Just as a disclaimer though, this is by no means at all the best method, and it was just what I ended up coming up with. The first thing I did was add about 100 ml of distilled water, and I mixed it around. Then I put it on a heating mantle, cranked up the temperature, and turned on the stirring. As it warmed up, all the solid stuff slowly melted, and it went back to being an oil. The major purpose of this step was to get rid of any excess triethylamine that still remained, as well as its salted reacted form. I let it mix around for a couple minutes, and then I took away the heating mantle. To help it cool, I used an ice bath, and I was really hoping that it would stay as an oil. However, it very quickly solidified, just like before. This told me that there was still a bunch of junk there, 
but it wasn't water-soluble stuff. This nasty water did reek of methyl sulfide and triethylamine though, so I quickly got rid of it. I now had to figure out a way to separate my oily 1 octane 3 own from whatever this solid junk was. The best way to do this was probably just with a solvent, so with some small samples I tried several different ones, and I found that hexanes worked the best. So here I added about 20 mils of it, took the flask off the stand, and really mixed things around. When I felt it was done I put it back on the stand, and this was what I had. The hexanes had dissolved my 1 octane 3 own, as well as some other impurities, and it left behind a whole bunch of white solid. Only after testing things with several different solvents and finding that hexanes worked the best, did I realize that this was probably just triphenylphosphine oxide. I think when I originally added the 50-50 mixture to knock it out, I still had too much DCM left over, so I wasn't able to get rid of all of it. The paper said to get rid of most of the DCM, but I think what they meant by that was pretty much all of it. I of course didn't interpret it that way, and I left way too much. But anyway, to make sure that I got out all my 1 octane 3 own from this powder, I did several washings. In total I did 5, each with about 20 mils of hexanes, so the final volume was around 100 mils. This was all the junk that was still left in the flask, which I think was mostly just triphenylphosphine oxide, but there might have been other stuff mixed in there as well. I'm not 100% sure. But anyway, moving on, I now just had to do a quick filtration. I did this by adding it to a funnel with a cotton ball in it, and the stuff that passed through was now crystal clear. When it was done, I washed the beaker and the cotton a couple times with hexanes, just to make sure I transferred as much as possible. I initially planned to distill off the hexanes right away, but I ended up running out of time. Something of course also came up the next day, so I was only able to get back to this about a day and a half later. And in this time, because I only covered the top with a watch glass, a lot of the hexanes had disappeared. Also, some crystals had formed at the bottom, but I'm not exactly sure what they were. They definitely weren't the 1 octane 3 own though, so when I added everything to a flask, I made sure to exclude them. Then just like the million other times that you've now seen me do this, I heated it up and I distilled off the solvent. It was eventually pretty much all gone, but there was just a small amount left. I really wanted to get rid of it, but I also didn't want to risk overheating it. So what I did instead was take it off the heating, and I directly pulled a vacuum on it. This caused the small amount of remaining hexanes to start boiling, and I left the pump on until it stopped bubbling. This only took a couple minutes, and when it was done, I took the flask off again. Now what I had was this kind of thick oily stuff, but it didn't freeze when it got back to room temperature. I was really happy about this, but still, it clearly wasn't very pure. I didn't mention it earlier in the video, but this entire process stank at every single step. At the beginning, it was because of the triethylamine and the dimethyl sulfide, but as I slowly purified things out, the smell changed. At this point, it felt like it was the cleanest smelling that I had gotten it so far, but it still was a little bit off. I was able to kinda smell what I thought was metallic, but it was still kinda being masked by something. The liquid was also a bit too viscous to be 1 octane 3 own, and it was also discolored, so there was clearly some other stuff in it. I spent a little while trying to figure out what the best way to purify this was, and I decided that it was another distillation. This one though, was quite different than the other ones. The boiling point of the 1 octane 3 own is relatively high, around 180 C, and I was worried that if I boiled it at atmospheric pressure, it might start to degrade. So for this one, I had to do it under vacuum. This wasn't much of an issue like the other ones though, because I didn't have any really low boiling point fractions that would make it past the condenser. Because I didn't have very much product to work with here, I didn't set up a full distillation, and I instead did something called a short path distillation. There were many reasons to do one like this, but for me, the main one was to just limit product loss. Like some of the other runs, I insulated it with aluminum foil, and then I waited for it to come over. When it's under vacuum, the boiling point of everything's going to decrease, so I had to calculate what the new boiling point would be. Based on the vacuum that my pump was pulling, and on the official boiling point of the 1 octane 3 own, I calculated that my new boiling point should be between 70 and 80 C. 
At almost exactly 70, stuff started coming over and the temperature slowly increased to around 76 C. Then it stayed there completely constant until suddenly the temperature started to drop. This told me that this fraction was now done and whatever wanted to come over next must have had a higher boiling point. This meant that it was no longer the one octane 3 own, so I stopped the distillation. I let it cool for a bit and then I repressurized everything and took off my flasks. In the distilling one, it was this really thick red oil, but it didn't smell anything like metal. It didn't smell bad or anything though, and it was kind of herbal or fruity, but I'm not really sure how to describe it. In the other flask, I had this faintly yellow liquid, which should be close to pure 1 octane 3 own. Its odor was incredibly powerful, and I was even able to smell it during the distillation when my pump was in my fume hood. The smell was apparently still able to get out and faintly fill up the room. Before I made it, I knew that the odor threshold was really low, but this still really surprised me. I've worked with some potent odors before, but nothing quite as strong as this. Also, the smell wasn't exactly what I was expecting, but I'll talk about that in a bit. My final yield was 2.5 grams, which was quite low. This is a percent yield around 40%, but the paper advertised closer to 90. I think the major reason for this though was that I scaled the process up about 50 times and my purification just wasn't as efficient. In any case though, I still made way more than I'm ever going to need, so it was good enough for me. Just to make sure that I really did make the right chemical, I sent a small sample to a friend at a university. He happened to have a small amount of pure 1 octane 3 own that he was able to compare to mine. On both of them, he did something called IR spectroscopy, which gave a fingerprint of each chemical. They were extremely close, which confirmed that I did make the right thing, except my sample was a bit dirtier. The major peak that I was looking for though, and that I was really happy to see, was this one at around 1682. It corresponds specifically to things called alpha-beta unsaturated ketones, which is exactly what we have in the 1 octane 3 own. It not only tells me that the oxidation was successful, it also tells me that the double bond is still there, which is something that I was concerned about in the beginning. But anyway, now that I've confirmed that I was able to make it, I can now mess around with it a bit. Okay, so to start off, I figured I'd just do the easiest test, which would be to smell it directly from the vial. So here I go. And I don't really find that it smells metallic at all. It's more of um, it's like a fungal kind of earthy smell, but it really doesn't smell metallic. And that's because I found in its really concentrated form, it smells quite different. In order to get the metal smell, it has to be really dilute, which you can do by dissolving it in some solvent or something and then spraying it. Or I think the simplest method is to just try and smell it through the vial. So if I do this, then it has that characteristic uh, metallic smell. And now for another test, I'm just going to compare it to what a nail smells like. So first I'll touch it to get my oils on it, to catalyze it and make the 1 octane 3 own and the other components. And when I smell it now, it has that characteristic metal smell, but it's not the same as pure 1 octane 3 own. And this is because the reaction with iron makes a lot of other compounds that make the smell a lot more complex. The 1 octane 3 own is just the most powerful one, and I feel that it kind of sits on top of all the others. The smell that you get when you touch metal also depends on what metal it is, and besides iron, the most common ones that can catalyze this reaction are copper and zinc. So for example, I have a penny here, and in this case, it's made of copper, and the smell is different than the nail. However, I can still tell that the most powerful part of it is still the 1 octane 3 own. I thought this was kind of interesting because even though the smells are quite different, I never really differentiated between iron and copper. I think I always just detected the 1 octane 3 own, called it metallic, and lumped them together. But now that I've had to think about it a lot for this video, I've noticed that they are distinctly different. And what I also find pretty interesting on top of this is that because it's your own oils and other things on your skin that are breaking down and then that's what you're smelling, it means that the metallic smell that you get after you touch a nail or a penny is different than the smell that someone else gets 
because they might have a different composition of oils and fats and whatever on their skin. I started thinking about this and I realized I've never actually smelled metal that other people have touched. I only smell what I've touched and the smell that it leaves on my hands. So the smell that you might think or other people might think is metallic is probably not the exact same one that you're used to smelling. On top of this, your own oil composition changes all the time depending on what you've eaten or if you're sick or something. So the metal smell that you get every time you touch metal probably isn't even consistent either. And it's just one other kind of point of interest with this chemical is that I mentioned before that it's so potent, but the question is, why is it so potent? Why are, as humans, are we so sensitive to it where, for example, I can put this vial in my pocket down here and I can smell it through the vial pretty easily if I sit in one spot for a while. So why are we so sensitive to it? And as far as I know, no one really knows, as with most of these things. But one thought is that it was evolutionarily potentially beneficial because when you get cut and blood spills onto your skin, the iron in the skin is able to catalyze the same reaction and create the one octane 3 own. And this means that you're potentially able to smell blood, and that could maybe alert you to some sort of danger that might be present. Or it could also be used predatorially to track down a wounded prey. But then again, the one octane 3 own is also a major component in the smell of mushrooms. Like I mentioned in the intro, one octane 3 all is one part, but the one octane 3 own is another major part. So it could also just be useful for us to track down mushrooms. And now the last thing that I want to do is address the main reason why I made this video. I originally intended to put the one octane 3 own on different things like glass, plastic, or wood, and then to try smelling it, but because it was so potent, I didn't end up having to. While making it and working with it, the smell ended up getting on everything, and I got more than enough non-metal related exposure to it. In the beginning, I wasn't really expecting it to change my perception much, but now, the idea that it smells metallic is kind of disappearing. I mean, I know that it has that characteristic metal smell that I've always been used to, but because I've now smelled it on things like glassware, some plastic, my fingers, and it's completely out of the context of metal, my brain is kind of not, it, I have a new association to this smell, so it's not only related to metal. And what's kind of weird is that before I smelled this penny and said it smelled similar and metallic, but it doesn't smell to me like it did weeks ago before I ever made this chemical. When I smell it, it's, my brain's telling me that one octane 3 own got onto this penny and now I'm smelling it because I'm, it's, I'm so used to smelling that chemical that it's very obviously there. And it just, yeah, it feels like it's like I did in the lab where I got it on glassware, then I smelled it on the glassware. It's no longer, I no longer have this idea that it's a metallic smell. I thought that was kind of weird. It changed my perception of smell in some way. I've rebuilt, I've rebuilt my association with this smell. And I guess like in the intro, when I said that I was going to see if it would mess with my brain, it turns out that it kind of did. But anyway, that's about it for my test on it. The last thing that I wanted to do was to try to get a few friends of mine to smell this directly, but completely out of context and not telling them at all what it is, just to see what their reaction was. Smell the thing in the vial. Don't open it though. Smell it through the vial. I don't smell anything. <laughs> oh, wait, what? You smell nothing. Metal? Metallic? Really? Metallic. Smell the little vial. Don't open it, don't open it. Just smell it. Just smell it. It smells like metal. That's it? It smells like metal. <laughs> it has like an odd metallic, you know, smell. Did you have any idea what it was before you started smelling it? No. It just smells like metal. <laughs> oh my god, that was a fast reaction. It smells like okay. pure metal. <laughs> you know spoon. You know spoons. It smells like spoons. It smells like spoons. This feels like a completely rigged setup because I didn't expect. That. <laughs> it just smells like metal. And now before I go, I just wanted to announce that I've finally started selling T-shirts again, and this is the first design that we've come up with. 
It's based on one of the first demos or experiments that I did on this channel called the Pharaoh Serpent. I had this commissioned by a friend. He did it completely by hand. And then I spent the last like three months or so making sure that it was adapted well to being on a t-shirt. I think it turned out really well. And if you want to pick one up for yourself and support my channel at the same time, there's a link in the description. As usual, a big thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Everyone who supports me can see my videos at least 24 hours before I post them to YouTube. Also, everyone on Patreon can directly message me, and if you support me with $5 or more, you'll get your name at the end like you see here.